this, this project has been shrouded in internal research and development secrecy for the last few years while we've been working on it. And it's wonderful that we have it to the point now where we are ready to uh, start coming out and talking to our, our friends in the industry about uh, this potential that we are working on developing here. As we all know, internal navigation is a, a huge requirement of all of our customers. Uh, we all want to have a ubiquitous capability to navigate a position anywhere in the world, anytime, and just never have to think about it. And it's a really hard problem. And there's a lot of smart people that are coming with a lot of different ways to do this. And we certainly feel that it's going to have to be a combination of several different capabilities and tools that are going to get us to that point. And so what we're going to talk about today is one of those which Boeing has been working on on research and development funds for the last few years uh, with a small focused team. And it's called Boeing Timing and Location, BTL. And so we're going to talk about it, go over a little bit of it. Uh, we're going to show you a demonstration of it actually operating right now in this room. And then uh, we'll open it up to some questions. And I brought all the smart guys that Jeff just talked about in case you guys come up with some tough ones, and I know that you will. So go ahead, Cliff. Okay, so what are we doing? We wanted to come up with the capability to, one, one of our targets is E911, so parts of these briefing came out of that, a briefing that we just gave to the FCC, and there's a white paper out and some documentation on that on there website if you ever want to look into it a little bit more data than we have in some of this uh, discussion here. But what, we, what we're trying to do is see if we can come up with a way to be able to do adequate level of positioning indoors, anywhere, to enable E911 location-based services and other things as one of the tools that a handset manufacturer chipset developer can use in order to be able to get that ubiquitous capability. And so what we have done is developed something, and I'll talk about it in a minute, using the Iridium satellite system, uh, which allows us to put all of the infrastructure in the sky. It's already there, it's already flying, it's gonna be flying for quite a while, and so we don't have to put anything on the ground. It's already up there, so we are found a way to leverage a capability of Iridium that's already in the sky. And so um, we are able, therefore, to be able to, to have this capability anywhere in the world that we want to turn it on, um, at any time uh, to be able to do that coverage, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes without having to install any hardware or any infrastructure on the ground. So what we use is uh, we'll be talking a little bit about Iridium and showing you some of the movement of the satellites. They are low Earth orbit. They're going by very, very quickly. And so we discovered some ways to be able to leverage that motion of a, of a very stable, known uh, orbit to be able to help us uh, to, to be able to geolocate off of it and do some other things, capabilities we'll talk about. A couple of the markets we're looking at is femtocell, cellular handsets. Uh, we have the potential to be able to retrofit this into uh, SIM cards so that we can get the capability out just as quickly as possible with the goal of being able to see if we can get help some of the wireless service providers to be able to meet E911 and other capabilities and requirements that they have for their customers, for all of our customers that we have here. Go ahead, Cliff. A little bit of Iridium, we all know about this one. Uh, it's had quite a sordid history, but Motorola built a fantastic capability up there. And we have used it for something it was never originally intended for. We'll be discussing that as we go further here. But they've got a really nice payload up there. And uh, so we have taken that and done some modifications on orbit to be able to allow us to use it for what we want right now. So they have a large user base, a lot of subscribers. They are growing nicely. There are 66 satellites and I believe several spares that are up in orbit right now. They anticipated that they will continue for the next several years before they go into their next constellation upgrade, which is called Next. Uh, they do have the global backbone. They have cross links. It's a really nice satellite capability in there. Boeing is a subcontractor. We do all of the operations for the Iridium Corporation. Uh, and so, therefore, since we do all the software and the capability upgrades, it was very nice for us to be able to work with our brethren in Boeing to be able to talk about some of these experiments and do some of the changes that we've done. Next, we'll be launching soon. Uh, what are we looking for here? The capability that we bring, that we, the reason that we wanted to use Iridium is because of its very close uh, neighbor to GPS-L1, the spatial diversity that it allows, and the fast motion. 
and also the capability that we can generate the signals that we want to generate on board the satellite. We don't have to do it on the ground and transpond them up and down. Made it simpler for us. So we take advantage of the high Doppler rate, the geometry changes, and the higher power. We'll talk about that as we go along. How does this thing work? Okay, so we are on the Iridium P4 paging channel. There are four paging channels of Iridium. Uh, the fourth one is the one that uh, this program has purchased in order to operate. It's at 1626.1 megahertz. It's the same frequency anywhere on the planet. Uh, so the, the chip that is going to be receiving this does not have to change frequencies, does not have to tune. Uh, the signal that comes down on, that si on the uh, Iridium paging usually is uh, 15 dB higher than their normal telecommunications signal. For our purposes, we go up to 9 dB higher than that. So we're approximately minus 100 dBm on the ground, I believe it is, of our signal strength. Uh, so it's uh, much more powerful than GPS. We also have, the signal comes down in a burst. It's a 20 millisecond burst, in which case we send down 24 bits of data in each one of those bursts, which gives us the 32 to 1 processing gain, which gives us another 20 dB or so of uh, power to be able to get into places like where we are right now. The whole goal of this program is to be able to operate deep indoors, to be able to get this signal as deep in as we possibly can. So what are we doing? As number two says in here, uh, as we all know, the oscillator in our user equipment is not terribly good. Those little TCXOs fly all over the place. The uh, oscillator on board the Iridium satellite is quite stable, and we um, continue to keep that oscillator tuned within a very narrow frequency range as the satellites continue to operate. So what our goal of this program is, is to be able to broadcast a signal from the Iridium satellites that allows a handset to be able to calibrate its internal oscillator. Very, very simple. That's all we're trying to do. So we are able to broadcast down a signal that allows us to be within approximately indoors, deep indoors, one to two microseconds, outdoors uh, more like 100 nanoseconds, and within just a few hertz. And so therefore, the receiver can calibrate its internal TCXO, know where it is, as soon as you know frequency, you're off to the races on being able to go into your positioning. Uh, and so what we found is a couple things. It's really nice to be able to do that, and we can aid a chip, hot start, by being able to give it that level of timing. But once you have that knowledge of time and of frequency indoors, all of a sudden you can start thinking about ranging off of that or being able to geolocate off of that between the ranging to the satellite and also the range rate, uh, the Doppler and the Doppler rate of change, which is very, very fast. It's plus or minus 35 kilohertz of Doppler as a satellite screams overhead. So we take advantage of that over a few seconds. The satellite moves so quickly that a single satellite looks like two or three satellites in half of a minute as we go through. So we use that to be able to do our positioning on it. Uh, go ahead, next one, please. So we have three modes that we operate. First mode is as an aiding signal. For, for instance, a GSM phone, which does not have very good frequency uh, it, or time. It may have very good uh, data wipe off bits and ephemeris information in its aiding, but it's tough to get the time to it. We still need to get the time. So with our ability to be able to get time down in the microsecond region, what we have found with some of our partners that we're working with on chipsets for this, we get approximately 4 to 5 dB increased sensitivity of acquisition of GPS and GLONASS and anything else that the, the, the receiver wants to do by being able to simply go from a couple of seconds of unknown on timing down to a microsecond or so. Second thing that we can do is a hybrid Iridium GNSS satellite ranging. So if you can only get two or three GNSS satellites in the location and there is an Iridium flying by, that can be another ranging signal that can be put into the filter to enable a user to be able to get uh, positioning calculation from the data that's coming in. So we can augment that way. And also we have what we see here, which is we are just so deep there is no way you're going to get any GNSS signals in here. And so we can do a rougher, coarser positioning off of our satellite signal alone, just using the um, BTL received signal. We can get that all over the place and I'll talk about that in a minute. So those are three modes. Go ahead. So what do we do? It starts in the upper right. The Iridium Control Center gives us certain pieces of data. 
which is the exact orbit of the Iridium satellites and a time, time bias offset of exactly where they are within the range of time that we keep those satellites. That information is sent to an operational server which is located in Huntington Beach at our, on our Boeing campus. And that, that data goes in two different directions. If you are a connected user, in other words, you're a cell phone and you're connected to any kind of a backbone, we can send that ephemeris and time update directly to the, to the phone to be able to be used kind of like aiding data. Uh, it's just a little text message, there's not very much information in there. The second way is if you're an unconnected user, you do not have any ability to get data another way, we also have included it inside of the broadcast. It takes a few broadcasts, you have to receive three or four broadcasts from each one of the satellites that you want to, to use for your geopositioning. However, it's at each one of the satellites broadcast every one and a half seconds, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here. And so you still get the data very, very quickly down into an unconnected user. So what happens is, then you have some level of attenuation between yourself and the satellites that you're trying to receive from. We penetrate through that and we either make the receiver more sensitive to be able to receive the GNSS satellites or if you just can't get it, we do positioning on our own. Next please. A lot of discussion about uh, how, how much attenuation is in various places out there, and we can all discuss this for days. But what I wanted to talk about here, what we're trying to get to, is the fact that uh, where, what's our value region on here? Of course, a standard GPS has a certain level of capability that it can do on um, attenuation. Then when they're aided, they get a bit better. With our aiding and a GSM type style of receiver, we get another four or five dB, which is our aiding value region. And then we go another 10 to 15 dB more than that, that we are able to receive the signal where you're not going to be able to get a GNSS signal at all. So this is the area where we have the Iridium only geolocation value. So we are able to get signals in places like this and be able to geolocate off of that where it's just not going to be possible uh, from a GNSS alone, no matter how much aiding you give that chip. Next, please. Another interesting thing, I was talking about the hybrid. Um, this is something that, that we've, we've discovered is pretty interesting uh, capability that we have on our signal. You can see here over a period of uh, GPS, of course, is a 12-hour. Iridium is a 100-minute period orbit. And so, in the 10 minutes that's shown here, that's how far uh, the Iridium satellite has traveled. It's traveled from one hemisphere to another. It goes on a direct overhead pass, it's 10 to 12 minutes. Versus the fact that at a, a, mid, a MEO orbit, GPS is not going to move very much during that time. And so, therefore, if you're in an area where you have huge occlusions, urban canyon or uh, railroad or something like that, uh, this, the capability that we have of being able to say, okay, you got four satellites in view, we're happy. GPS is great. You got three, well, we can add one more. Two, we can add one more. One, we can add another, and or zero, and we can do it on our own. So no matter how many GNSS satellites are out there, we can add to it in order to take advantage of that and leverage the accuracy in order to get us ourselves a better um, uh, position accuracy and to get a position instead of missing one. So our performance, how good is this, Mike? Um, most of the time, as you'll see in a minute here, in continental United States, for instance, there are three or four satellites normally in view. Uh, and so we broadcast from every satellite that touches the service area where we want to operate. Um, each one of the Iridium satellites. I'll show you a little bit about what their coverage is in a couple, couple minutes here. And so what you can see here on the, on the right-hand side is we initialized, I think this was two or three kilometers away. This is assuming that you're like a cell phone, and if you know which tower you're talking to, then you know approximately where you are in a very rough order. Uh, so we initialized it at that point, and then as soon as we started getting the bursts, we immediately went down to 150 meters. And then, and this is with our existing capability right now, kind of wandered around a little bit and went down towards 100 meters or so. Uh, in a, a minute, I think it was. Uh, so what's going on right now is with our existing capability and our, our existing maturity of our software, we're approximately 50 to 100 meters in about 30 seconds, which meets or exceeds the E911 requirements. 
uh, where we think we're going to be in a year when we're ready to go operational is the 30 to 50 meter range on that capability. And then we have some other ideas of how to make that even better as we move into the future uh, with some differential capabilities that we're working on right now. So as you can see here, we have tested this all over the place, um, many, many different uh, buildings. We found that we can normally get the signal anywhere above ground. The reason for that, I'll show you in a minute, but it's because the satellites themselves, the signal that we have, if you're in a third story of a 20-story building, we cannot go through 17 stories. However, we can go through five or six, and the satellites are very seldom overhead. They're always off to the side. And so you're not looking at going through 17 different stories. You're looking to go through just a few floors. And that we can do very easily with the system. So go ahead. By the way, it worked under snow. I personally had to dig the uh, cave to put the thing in. So we verified that. So our capability that we have, Urban Canyons, indoors, um, and we think that we have a tool here that can be combined with other capabilities that are in the modern chips that are coming out to really provide an, an extra uh, added capability to be able to really solve some of the issues that, uh, that our customers are having there. We plan to roll the capability out across continental United States in about a year from now. We are working with uh, service providers and chip makers right now in order to come up with initial ASICs uh, to do some testing, and we really are excited about the capability. And we'd love to talk to anybody in here who uh, is interested in any other opportunities they can have for very precise time and frequency deep indoors, uh, as our program does enable. And it's, uh, the, the actual processing power is uh, about 20% of the power needed to, uh, do a GP, to do GPS to process that. So it's very simple to be able to receive. The burst is on for 20 milliseconds and then it's off for several milliseconds and then back on a second and a half later from each one of the different satellites. So it's very simple to be able to receive and process. And it can use the same uh, uh, antenna as is presently used for GPS. Okay, now onto the fun stuff. We'll show you. It's show and tell, not just tell. So let's start off by looking at uh, Iridium for a minute here. Come over on this side. Okay, so this G-Predict software, these are the Iridium satellites uh, that are around the world. We're up there. And um, each one of the satellites covers an area approximately the size of continental United States. They're all cut into, they have 48 individually programmable spot beams, which we have the ability to turn on and off anywhere in the world, anytime that we want, um, at whatever power that we're interested in. We create all of the data in our operations center in Huntington Beach. And so therefore, like right now, you can see that uh, where we are here, this is Portland, this is us. And we got five satellites that are visible to us at the present time. Each one of those satellites is broadcasting a BTL signal every one and a half seconds that we are able to receive, most of them anyway. There's going to be some that are just going to be behind a mountain or in a place where you're not going to see it, but we have several other satellites that are up that we can get the signal from. Obviously, the more satellites that you have, the faster uh, the position is going to converge on our column and filter. So now we go over to take a look at what the actual broadcasts look like. This, these are the broadcasts. So what we have here is um, each one of these, as each one of these filters through, that's a broadcast that we are receiving. So right now we're getting them. Uh, we are in a test mode presently, so only a couple of the satellites at a time are broadcasting overhead. However, we are getting them here. So 64, which one is 64? It's up here. It's to the north, down around. This is 30 degrees, about 15 degrees elevation or so is coming in. And if we watch for a while, we'll get some more as well that come through from the, the different satellites as they fly by. This over here is showing our carrier to noise. If we're outside, it's between 80, it's about 80 dB or so. Uh, and you can see that these are pretty good. So they're around in the low 40s. So we're approximately 40 dB of attenuation right here. And this is the receiver. This is the antenna right here. We're going to a little USRP, which is doing a digitizing, and all the processing is being done on this computer. So this is it. So we're receiving right here uh, these signals. 
You can see the Doppler of the satellites as they're coming through, the minus 33, that's, uh, that means that one's pretty low on the horizon. It's moving really, really fast away from us. So that's the data that we use. We have a, a pseudo range and we also use a Doppler and the rate of change of the Doppler to each one of the satellites in order to be able to calculate our position. And now, show you what the position looks like. Let's see where we are. Okay, can you make that a little bigger, Cliff? There we go. So this is about uh, half an hour's worth of data. You can see, remember, we're talking about right now we're 50 to 100 meters. That blue circle is a 35 meter radius. So we are, what, in here, someplace? So it's pretty close, it's bounced around a little bit, but that's uh, pretty normal of what we're seeing right now in the, in the present capability of the prototype code that we have going on. So the signals that are coming down are giving us that kind of data and that uh, the original data came in, took about 30 seconds or so to get when we started on this and then we just kept it running. We are pretty deep, at least it's showing us pretty close to where we are inside of here which uh, makes us pretty proud to be able to do. Yeah, this is a little tougher than out there. This is a couple dB more of attenuation. So the satellite that we are looking at is still, is that still low on the horizon? It looks like it's 64 now. Which one's 64? I can't see from up here. Is that this guy? Okay, so he's coming south to, or north to south, right directly overhead, and you can watch as the bursts come in here. And so we're 38, 49, that's another satellite. So we're, taking, we're getting two or three satellites right now, including the one that's going directly overhead of us. That wall's pretty simple to get through, and that one is as well, to the south and the west. But, uh, we, but we can also get them easily through this ceiling in here. So you are seeing geolocation in 40 dB environment right now, down to that level of accuracy. So I'm afraid that's the whole thrilling thing, you guys. Um, I would love to be able to answer any questions that we can. Go ahead, please. Uh, two questions. One, vertical accuracy. And the second, what's your strategy with all the spot beams? Do you broadcast your signal on them all simultaneously or sequentially? Or what's your strategy? Okay, uh, the question was uh, what's your vertical accuracy and also a little bit about how the spot beams uh, work on this. We actually got that question as well from the FCC. Our, we haven't worked a lot on vertical yet. Um, that's because we were so worried about trying to get the horizontal. We thought that was what the E911 guys required. But, it, but from the initial look at it, and we're still really looking at that right now, it looks like it's pretty circular on our error. And so if we can get this level of accuracy on horizontal, it's going to be about the same. So in a year when we're operational, it'll be 30 meters, 50 meters around in there. It's not going to get you to the floor, but it's going to get you potentially to the part of the building that you're going to be in. Uh, regarding the, the actual broadcast, uh, how we do it, uh, we broadcast three different beams simultaneously, and we keep round robining those around the satellite. So that if you're using, the satellite is actually broadcasting every 90 milliseconds somewhere. If it's, if all of the beams, if it's going right down the pipe, right down Colorado, let's say, and it's in the middle of the country or middle of our service region and we have them all activated. Uh, and, and so it's three at a time. Uh, they are dispersed. And so a user will usually only see one beam. Sometimes if, sometimes they'll see two beams, but that doesn't hurt us on this. And so uh, every one of the, so three beams are broadcasting every 90 milliseconds. So from any position on the, the surface of the earth that you are within the service region, you will see a broadcast every 1.5 seconds from every satellite overhead. One of those beams is going to touch you every one and a half seconds from all different directions, as you can see from here. So each one of these guys right now looks like you've got three. You've got one overhead and two. This would actually give us some pretty good Z. Um, so that so we, we would see, uh, in this case, each one of those broadcasting every one and a half seconds to, to the receiver. And every one of those broadcasts gives you enough data to be able to do the time aiding we talked about to the microsecond level. And also each one of those is another input into our common filter and updates our position estimate in case you're moving. Although we don't anticipate, it's a deep indoor, we don't anticipate moving 60 miles an hour on this. 
Uh, although we are doing some testing right now at the railroads up to 100 miles an hour to see how well it does. And we have had it in airplanes before, so we know it does work at higher speeds. But it's a little tough to do the truth in those times unless you've got GPS going at the same time. Uh, so we're, we're anticipating walking speed, reasonable speed, or driving inside of a covered garage. Uh, we've, we have tested this in five and seven level parking structures in downtown Los Angeles. Signal comes through just fine. It either goes through um, or else just bounces around on the side. Because you can see here, a uh, really important point is, if you're here, the satellites are moving and they're almost always fairly low, which is where we want them anyway for positioning, right? But the nice part about that is it means that you don't have to go through too many stories. We can go through almost infinite number of walls. Those are pretty easy. It's the, the ceilings and the floors that are the tough stuff to go through that are the what, 5 to 8 dB each or whatever number you want to use there. So maybe we can go through 5 or 6 of those. But we, but it, So as long as it's kind of at an angle of 30 or 40 degrees, you're going to be at an at a, uh, angle that the signal doesn't have to go through quite as many. Long answer to your short question. Are you okay? Yes? So you're saying that that antenna in real time is producing that data? That's what I'm saying. So a bunch of us go stood around it, held our hands over it, nothing would change. Let's see. <laughs> I don't. I don't think people at Elvan. We 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 got too much water. No, I don't think that makes too much of a difference. Oh, it just stopped. I must have broken it. Well, take it back. I did, we did go through five feet of snow. Uh, so it, you know, it goes. That, that was pretty good. That was hard packed snow too. The GPS didn't make it. Good question. Right here. <laughs> yeah, right here, right now. <laughs> yes. Um, you talked a little bit about our consumption of tax funds and cell phones because of tax Okay, the question is about power consumption on cell phone. And this is a really, really interesting thought here. Um, Okay, and GPS, we're broadcasting all the time. We're receiving all the time. We're always having to have that receiver turned on, right? And we're processing. So on this one, we broadcast 20, for 20 milliseconds, and we know when the next broadcast is going to occur. As soon as you get one, all of the Iridium satellites are synchronized to each other. And so you may have, like right now, one, two, three, four, five satellites that are overhead and each one of those are broadcasting, but you know exactly when to expect the next broadcast from the next satellite once you get your first broadcast. So therefore, if we wanted to, in order to cut down on power, we could turn our receiver off and then turn it back on. If you really were crazy about trying to get that power down in order to get those bursts, because it's off, it's off, dead off when it's off. Uh, also, uh, the actual processing power required, as I said, is is much, much less than GPS to do this. It's four 256-bit codes that are coming down. It's, it's just really simple to be able to do. And so therefore, uh, the processing power required to process itself is less, and because of the burst nature of it, you can turn on and off your receiver to be able to have a lower duty cycle. That's something that's vitally important when we're discussing this possibility of the SIM card implementation. Um, if, if you have a really old 2G phone, that was never made to be able to do anything like GPS. And so, therefore, if we sh stick a chip in there uh, that can receive a GPS signal, it's just going to drain that battery really fast. And so that's something that we're, we're really looking at right now, trying to reduce that just as much as we can. So I think that um, we're, we're looking at a significant savings. I don't remember what the number was on that chart. I, I, it's not in my brain. 70 or 80 percent savings, I think, on power uh, for a fix compared to a GPS. Good power savings in, uh, under the scenario of uh, I'm sorry? not getting a fix. Oh. It's possible if you wanted to, you could do that. Um, that that that's one way of doing it. You don't have to, but certainly you could. Um, and and another, just, just one more point, which is your point, which is an excellent one. If, you, if we take a look at a ConOps, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got a cell phone and I just dialed 911. So the cell phone wants to go off and it wants to know where am I. So if we are in outdoors, you're going to get GPS immediately, yay, you know, we're great. If you are in the top story of a, of a certain type of structure, and you're just on the edge where GPS today may not be able to get it, but with our four or five dB of enhanced sensitivity, it might, the, the cell phone could turn on the GPS and then it could um, 
turn on the beat, if it, wait a couple seconds, if it doesn't get time, turn on BTL, get time instantly, throw that back over to GPS, and then see if GPS works. If it can get, go then from time into going off and going and getting its uh, ranges. And if it can't, turn off GPS and just turn on BTL. You know, there's, there's con ops ways to be able to deal with the, the whole power issue to be able to make that work. And again, that's up to uh, the handset manufacturer and the chipset manufacturer, and we'd love to have the opportunity to work on that stuff with them. One other question. Okay, the bomb impact, the important part. Um, we believe that the silicon impact is approximately 10% of a multi capability chip right now, adds maybe 10% silicon to it for the receiver um, and uh, the processing is an insignificant overhead if you've got a, a decent processor inside of there the software is I don't think it's going to make any difference there uh, so the actual the actual uh, bill of materials is going to be pretty minimal we do have to pay for these bursts I'm paying for every one of those that's coming down right now I'm paying iridium and so there is going to be a charge that is going to be related to the chip as a service fee royalty, something like that. That's either going to be at the chipset level or the handset level. And that's something that we'll be working on with the operators, but it's very small. It's not like a, a dollar a minute Iridium cell call, that's for darn sure. Uh, we've worked out a very favorable partnership with Iridium on this thing. And we can turn on uh, all of the areas that we want to do and uh, for an insignificant my opinion anyway. I know everything is significant bill of materials. I understand that. I'm not I'm trying not to laugh it off, but uh, but we don't feel that it's going to be adding a dollar to the bill of material or something that, that's just way too painful. It's going to be in the in the pennies region. So the idea would be that those bursts only come down once you once you have the phone up E911. Actually that's a very good question, Tom. Um, there is the potential of being able to do it as an on-call, and we thought about that for a while, an on-demand capability, but we really think it's best to just, once, once we have a deal with a manufacturer or set of manufacturers or service providers, Continental United States, let's say, or something, we will just say, starting on this day, we will provide this amount of power, 24-7, 365, for this amount of money per handset. And, and just turn it on region by region. Now we do have the ability to turn them on and off or change the power levels if we want to. Uh, but I think it's probably going to be the simplest way to, to put the business plan together is to just say, okay, starting uh, September 1st, 2012, CONUS is now on, just turn it on. And just uh, uh, have a deal between Boeing and Iridium and the, the providers to be able to pay for that. I think that's how it'll work. That's how it seems to be shaping up. Go up with five dollars a month, ten dollars a month, or something. Cents. Okay. If AT&T chose to pass it on, but suddenly, you know, you have the potential of being able to do um, E nine one one level capability anywhere that you go. You don't have to worry about string of pearls. You don't have to worry about sparse sites. All of the things that they're doing now. And if you think about an AT&T, let's talk about them for a second. Uh, they. We all know the FCC is going to change the requirements for E911 to add indoors. I mean, it's going to happen. It hasn't yet, and then so far there's been a lot of discussion of weasel wording around of how to make the capability that they have today uh, up meet the requirement. The requirement has been written very carefully. Uh, we believe that the FCC is not going to be standing for that too much longer, that they're going to force the providers into being able to have this capability anywhere. And so the providers are looking at an enormous amount of infrastructure to do that if they have to do it with the existing uh, architecture that they've got now. You know, it's expensive. And the maintenance is expensive. It's tough. Now, for us, what we'll say is you give us X cents a chip or handset, uh, and, and we will provide you the capability, you don't, and you, you don't have to worry about that infrastructure. You don't have to worry about the maintenance of that infrastructure. And we feel that that is a a very positive business model for the service providers to be able to do. And we've had many, many contacts with them already. They're very interested in this. So I think that's how it's going to work. It'll just get turned on. And then others will be able to use it as they need. 
but it'll be for some kind of a royalty per chip, probably, somehow, that we will share and work with our chipset partners on. We certainly don't want to have to bill everybody every month for this capability. You know, you've got to make it simple. Okay. Any else? Yes? Uh, in a GPS receiver, uh, you measure, uh, you hold your microphone on the site, and you might want to be able to eliminate the clock error. Assuming that you're only receiving a single satellite, and you use for it to pass uh, over you and wait several tens of seconds, what does that mean in terms of the requirements that you have to look off of your heads? Excellent question. The con ops of our timing aiding capability is that the cell phone, let's say we're a connected cell phone, and we have been able to get a tiny amount of data, which is a, a couple of bits on an ephemeris and a couple of bits on a clock bias offset. Every single burst that you receive from the first burst of any Iridium satellite that's going overhead will immediately enable you to calibrate your clock. One burst, just one. Uh, and then every time you get another burst from any other clock, you can recalibrate it again if you want to, depending on how much your clock, whatever your clock drift is. And so it's immediate, it's essentially instantaneous. What, what I was saying is if you are an unconnected user, that's when you need to get four or five bursts to start doing geopositioning from the Iridium. But you can do clock calibration on just the one burst that's coming down. We have enough data inside of that. Sure. Well, re remember that our, okay, I, I, I understand. However, remember that our accuracy is 30 to 50 meters. Uh, and so there, if we were a couple meters accuracy, I'm with you. We need something really, really good inside of there. However, uh, it, it, if you assume, so when it comes down, the, the error is either clock error or it's movement, motion, right? right? And so it's one of those two things. So the phone, so the, the, the column and filter just needs to make a decision on which one of those two things that it is when it receives the data. So we will receive, another thing is, when you receive from multiple satellites, you can remove that. You can remove the clock error. And usually, we can receive from multiple satellites. The times that you only get one satellite are very, very seldom that we've found so far. Uh, and so that would be more of an issue at those times. But if you can get two satellites, you can take the clock error out right away on this, from, from one burst from each one of the satellites. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. We can turn this on anywhere in the world we want. Our plan is to turn it on first in continental United States and all, probably simultaneously in Europe. Um, those are two areas that we know well, and we've talked to a lot of potential customers that seem interested. We can, but we can, then our next area we're thinking of is probably Asia Pacific area, which is very large, and so we have to be a little careful about exactly what areas that we turn it on and don't turn it on there because it can get expensive. Uh, but no, we can turn it on in any spot, so a, a spot as small as a state, as a single beam, or a region any time that we want, anywhere in the world that we want to do this. So the plan is continental United States, Europe, Asia Pacific, what, wherever else we need it. And we could turn it on for a period of time someplace, if there was Olympics or there was something going on someplace, and then turn it back off again. We just have to have contracts to be able to do that. It's very easy. It takes us, uh, from when we get a request, it's somewhere around 30 seconds to turn the signal on anywhere in the world that we want to do it. Now, we're over at, at the booth. Uh, we'll, we're going to pick the system up and move it over there, and, and you'll see it. Uh, we'll, start, we'll start another set of, of calculations over there, and so any more questions, uh, we'd love to hear them and talk to you. So thank you very much.